Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Stephanie Stevens Show. Thank you guys so much for joining me here on my channel. Um, today on the show, we are talking about mental health and health wellness um, and during this pandemic time. Now, as you guys know, a lot of us are cooped up in our homes and we are going through a lot of stress, mainly with the fact that we're trying to work, we're trying to live, we're not used to being cooped up in our homes, we're used to being social, and there's a lot of things that have come into play that sometimes we have overlooked. And today on the show, I want to bring the focus on people that have mental illness, drug addiction, sex addictions, alcoholism, that have fallen off of the wagon. And how should we address those situations now? How should we reach those people? So today I brought on a good friend of mine, Mr. Chad um, Connolly, to discuss some of those issues. Um, he works in the justice system and he has a lot of information that can help a lot of us out there and great information on how you can um, get a lot of the help that you might need in this pandemic time. So I just want to welcome to the show today, Mr. Chadwick Conley. How you doing? I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. You know, I, I put a little shout out prior to the, fil the filming. I thought we were actually filming a conversation. So I just want to say, while we're talking about all this in health and wellness, last night we saw a story on Drag Race Canada that addressed mm -hmm. addiction and violence, which is a prevalent, um, prevalent issue in our community. And one of the biggest issues with that is it's underreported because traditionally gay people do not like to deal with policing services. Mm -hmm. um, for whatever reason, there's been, there, you know, there's been years of damage, especially with our BIPOC people in our community. So last night, uh, Toronto's Ryan Boa, sorry, Boa, uh, was eliminated last night. Um, but his story came out, and it was a story that came out four years ago, where people started to look at um, how alcohol damages our lives. And it's just not from the drinking, but the people that we did, because Ryan talked about on the first episode when people were like, what is he doing here? Like, he's got a horrible reputation. Then he started to talk about how he got sober. Mm -hmm. And I bet you had Ryan been sober two, four years ago when this happened, this story may have not happened because the, the choices that we make when we drink are not the choices that we make when we're sober. And Ryan said, I brought this guy home to have drinks. I wasn't into it. And all of a sudden I was knocked out. My stuff was stolen. This should not be happening. If this is happening to you, find me on Facebook, find me on Instagram, find me on Twitter, report your story to me. I can report it on your behalf. I can get you the help that you need. Please do not think that you need to sit with that. It'll drag you down like it, Ryan talked about how it dragged him down until he finally said I was no longer embarrassed and I wanted people to learn from my story. So to the people that supported Ryan through that, I thank you for that. And regardless if you got eliminated last night, Ryan, you're a fucking legend. You are funny as hell and you're gonna do well in this, in this industry, and I'm gonna, we're gonna see you around for a long time. So back to you, Steph. <laughs> okay, well, like you said, is it's great that you are giving people information about how they can reach out to people when they need help. Right. And yeah, sometimes the LGBT two-spirit pronoun community don't report such incidents because of shame or because of the mere fact of they're scared or just the fact that they might think nobody cares. Right. So it's great that you've given them that this right. insight. There, there's, there's one of the biggest problems is usually with these incidents, they usually involve drugs. And people think that if the cops come to answer a call like that and they see that there's a line of, of whatever on the table or there's a leftover baggie, that you're going to be arrested for possession. Well, you cannot be arrested for possession when they're answering to an assault in a private residence. As long as there's not enough drugs on the table that it looks like you're trafficking, they will not even be concerned about the drugs that are on that table. They are not allowed to. It is called a legal search and seizure unless they've shown up because they know there's drugs there 
and they have a warrant to say that we're here to get the drugs, they cannot hold you accountable for those drugs. It is not illegal in this country to be high. It is legal to possess and it is illegal to sell. It is not illegal to use. So please don't let that be a hurdle. Okay. Now, now that you've made that clear for a lot of the people out there and, and people that just might be watching these, this show in small towns, just get the help that you need. Reach right. out to somebody. Either call 911, a friend, a neighbor. Just don't be scared. Reach out and get the help that you need. And yes. um, today our show is about just that. And a lot of times when you think about it, Chad, when people fall off the wagon and in this pandemic time, there's a lot of things that aren't open, that used to be open, right. that would give these people the support that they need. And as right. you know, we've been watching a lot of the videos and I've been watching a lot of the girls do their, do their live shows. And I've noticed <clears throat> including me, I mean, I've had one or two extra drinks, but I have now noticed with a lot of the performers, because the pandemic is taking so much longer, the girls are now moving back into their old habits. I'm right. seeing a lot of them that didn't used to be sloppy are now sloppily drunk or high <laughs> in some sense, and I'm noticing it now more than ever. So here's, here's, here's the issue that we have in hand here is we've been in a pandemic situation now for roughly six months. Mm -hmm. So in this day and age, we are so used, used to having an abundance of access to whatever we need. We are blessed in this country. I do not care what people say. We have more freedoms in this country than the United States. We have more freedoms in this country than the UK. We have you know, maybe Switzerland may, may compete with us, but in terms of multiculturalism in this country, we still experience racism, of course, but we don't experience it at the level that we see in other countries. And I'm not excusing and I'm not, I'm not justifying, but in this country, we have an access of service. And that is because we are taxed at such a high bracket that social programming is a thing in Canada. And, you know, when, uh, when this started, when they started to socialize medicine in this country, which happened, I think back in the early 1920s with uh, Representative Douglas and then also the guy in the East, I forget, it's something that I studied in school. It's probably boring. We don't need to get into it. But we, you know, in January, I could walk out of my apartment and I could be at, there's, 10 different 12 step meetings for me to choose from within a 10 minute walk of my house. I live uh, in Vancouver's West End, which is predominantly the gay community. It's like church street, but not as fun. Mm -hmm. And um, we have the LGBT center, which has a new meeting seven days a week of Alcoholics Anonymous. We have two Narcotics Anonymous meetings a week and one Crystal Meth Anonymous meeting just at that building alone. And that's not including the neighborhood churches and community houses where these meetings. And now all of a sudden we are told these are shut down and we need to move our meetings to an online platform. Mm -hmm. Now I'm going to tell you something. I feel, um, I feel weird when I'm looking at you on a screen doing this, right? Like mm -hmm. I would, you know, in, in a different time because I have access to flight benefits, I would have said, you know what? I'm going to come into your show. We're going to do it live. I'm going to fly over to Toronto. I'm going to spend the night, you know, and fly back the next day. Right. Mm -hmm. um, it's very strange to talk to somebody on zoom and make that connection. And, mm -hmm. and really, because I like to see people dead on. I like to visit with them visually straight up. I don't like, I don't like to sit on FaceTime or Facebook messenger. And so to do that with a 12 step meeting, um, because as I spoke earlier, when we, we had done a previous taping, I said the, 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 the opposite of addiction is connection. Mm -hmm. And it's really hard to develop that connection and make those connections with people who are struggling with the same issues you are when you're not in the same room. Because, you know, part of showing up to, to a meeting is, you know, you get a handshake or a hug. People are there to support you. I'm mm -hmm. struggling, whatever somebody walks up to you after the meeting and says, hey, let's go grab a coffee. Let's talk this out, right? Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. Now, all of a sudden, all of these are not possible, mm -hmm. right? Because they can't even meet you for a coffee off Zoom because there, there was no coffee shop open at one point. I mean, Vancouver had gone like Toronto and it was essential service only. So the drugstores, you know, the drugstore was open, but only for so many hours a day. There was reduced hours at the grocery store. And it was, if you were seen on the street, you know, the, you know, people would be like, why aren't you in your houses? Whatever, right? Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden you have an addict who was new to recovery. They could have been one weekend before this pandemic started, their first meeting could have been the day before the shutdown happened. We don't know, right? The blessing that I had through this is that I have long-term sobriety. Like I, I, I've been, mm -hmm. you know, I've been sober for 19 years now. And so I have those skills and those tools that for the last five years, I've been in post-secondary education, plus I work full-time, which doesn't leave me a lot of, of social time. But if something happened like this when I was in my first year of sobriety or in my first two years of sobriety, would I still be sober? I can't answer that. But I do know that I would not have been able to do what I'm doing now back then, mm -hmm. right? And so it's important in, the in people's first five years of recovery that they maintain relationships with people in the rooms and that they're hanging out with people in recovery and doing things with recovery based people. And, and the bars and stuff like that, they'll always be there when, you know, one day you're going to be able to walk into a bar and not be triggered to drink. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that's going to happen 30 days into your recovery. That's what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. So so one of the things that, that both Ontario and BC has talked about, um, their government has released statistics, is that there has been an increase of overdoses on a weekly basis. So, for instance, in Vancouver, there has been an average of 80, over 80 overdoses per week, which means burnout for our EMTs, burnout for our police officers, and burnout for our ER staff. And, of course, the increased risk of death. And Ontario has said that they have noticed that there's been a lot of, um, that there's been a lot of drug related crime increase in Toronto. So people are struggling to pay for their drugs because they're not working. They're, you know, the ways they normally commit crime are not available to them right now. And so now they're doing new things and they're not smart about it. So they're getting caught right away. So this is happening because we don't have an access of services right now. And they just recently started to open up 12-step meetings in BC, but you can only have X number of people in the room, and you have to have two meters apart between the chairs. And so I struggle with that because you don't know if that first person that you're turning away desperately needs to be there. And meanwhile, there's somebody that's got 25 years of clean time sitting in a chair. And I'm not saying it's their fault because they don't have ESP. They don't know what's happened at that door. But you never turn people away at a meeting and now mm -hmm. you have to because the government says you have to. Mm -hmm. So this is why this is happening, right? And also people uh, getting access to counseling right now has been a challenge because people can't meet with their counselors in person anymore. They've got to do it on a screen and it's not comfortable. It's not, I don't think that I could sit in a therapy session and I don't go to therapy. I did years ago, but I don't think that I could do therapy on a Zoom call. It just doesn't seem right. Okay, and so what do you think needs to be done? What do you think needs to happen? So what needs to be done is people need to start thinking outside of the box. They need to realize that, that recovery-based services for addiction and alcoholism and sex addiction are necessary services. They're not to be considered additional services or non-essential. A meeting can save a fucking person's life. So to me, that's, that's essential, right? Mm -hmm. Nobody should have to die of a drug overdose. Nobody should have to feel that there's nothing left for them to do but use drugs. And so the government is starting to recognize that how important these services are and they're starting to open them up, but they're still putting those parameters on them, right? You can only have 50 people in a room. You can only do this, you know, and I get why it's there because you don't need to have somebody show up with COVID and then infect 50 people with, with COVID. I get it. Um, 
So thankfully, because there's a lot of, you know, the weather has been nice in Vancouver, but today is kind of really cold and rainy. Mm -hmm. um, people have been holding meetings outside because there's lots of park space, Stanley Park, we have Queens Park. There's a lot of, you know, it's not like Toronto where like there's, n there's not a lot of outdoor space for people to go chill out and have a meeting. Like I think Cothra Square, you could probably have a couple people, but even now they've done so much gentrifying of that, of that park. Like a lot of the grass area has been used to do the AIDS monument and plant nice trees and it looks lovely, but it, it, it's taken that space away where you could probably get 10 or 12 people to sit and be like, you know, to have a meeting of a 12 step meeting, you only need you and one other alcoholic to do that. Right. But okay. it's important. Yeah. But no, not to cut you off, but where, right. Now, you know, a lot of these support workers don't want to work because they know that most of the time marginalized people or people that are seeking desperate help in a sense are probably carrying some form of a, of a, of a, of a, of a, of a STD or some disease or some kind of concerning something in a sense. And where do you think the government's going to get these workers that normally would be, because they feel like they're in a safe environment normally, but for them to know that, like you said, the COVID is out there, where do you think the government's going to get these workers? So I've, I've actually noticed, and thankfully, um, most of the hospital staff and support workers have been working, and that is because um, we have been given additional money to work. So we are getting what is, we, we are getting at the end of August, what is called um, the COVID top up, which is where you can, you'll have earned a maximum, a maximum of $3,500 additional pay over from the work you've done, depending on the hours from March 15th until July 15th, and you'll be paid at the end of August. So people at first were hesitant to work, but then when they were like, oh, I'm being paid $6 more an hour, I'm going back to work. So thankfully, um, you know, places like, you know, um, Community Connect, Connect Toronto and stuff like that, their workers, mm -hmm. apparently they've, they've had exceptional um, attendance records. This is the best their executive director said. <laughs> it's amazing what you can do when you're offering extra money. Mm -hmm. Now, so thankfully, people thought that support workers and jail and jail guards were going to be the biggest concern but once they they sort of financially give it gave a financial incentive for showing up to work mm -hmm. that sort of changed it one of my dear friends works at the provincial jail in um burlington and he said you know um the problem is not showing up to work the problem is explaining to the inmates that their visitations are canceled until this is done mm -hmm. um which for me is, is kind of, you know, I, I, I understand the side of why they're not allowed to come. Mm -hmm. But when you're dealing with a person who's in, in jail and you, like even their first time or whether they're doing life on installment, mm -hmm. it is important that they maintain contact with their families, right? Well, you know, um, well, you know it's, 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 for me, I find there's a lot of gaps in between a lot of trying to get people services, trying to make a decision about where we are with the pandemic, who, which group of people it's affecting the most, who are in most likely to succumb to catching the virus, who's more likely to spread the virus. And at the end of the day, there's a big gap between the doctors, the nurses, the support workers, government, and like you said, is that we need some sort of essentials for people that are marginalized in a sense. But when people are in their homes, you would think doctors and nurses or some nurses would be knocking on doors. Right. Now, what I found was that if, if you're, you know where these people are and you know that they're home, and you know that nine times out of the 10, they're safe in their homes. But I think there needs to be some sort of a visitation, a knock on the door to say, are you okay? Because like you said, the virtual thing is not working. And 
it works for some people, but it doesn't work for, I would say, 90% of the people because most people and mainly older people don't even know how to use a computer. Right. So for them to try to do virtual meetings, whether they're, because you know, are, there's a lot of older people in the shelters, a lot of older people that do drugs, a lot of young people that just don't care that they're in the situation that they're in. And they're not going to just pick up a phone and say, you know, I need help, this and that. They're going to go back to the same routine that they're used to doing, hanging out in the community and looking for a quick fix. Right. Now, I'm not. Like, like now, I just want to bring up a couple of things and then you can run it down for me. Like I said, there's a lot of people are, are going to try to go back to their old ways. And it comes back really quick when you're isolated or there's no services and no help for you. Now we're going to see certain things like the sex addiction. The bathhouses are closed. closed. Where a lot of gay men would have probably been socializing and doing drugs and something that they thought was a safe environment. Two, the gay bars, only seating 50 people. Now, these are alcoholics that attend bars on a regular basis or want to go there and see their favorite queen, and they just have an attention to drink just a little bit more than you. Go, go, go see Scarlet for their 12 o'clock beer. Hello. Yeah. Now, we're seeing, now we're going to see a, a rise in evictions because the government has now said that the, the landlord and tenant board can proceed now with evicting people. Also, the work situation in this pandemic, with a lot of the businesses closing, there's no real numbers of how many businesses have really closed and how many people are really out of work. So, where did, But I do understand them when they talk about the evictions and that the money that they have given to the majority of us to help us along. Now, I'm not saying um, that people should be evicted from their homes, but the fact that the government gave you $2,000 extra a month or whatever it was, which should have carried you for three months or four months in this pandemic that we have been going through. What do you think needs to happen now? With, with how do you think do you think it's what do you think should happen with the evictions let's talk about that for a minute so uh, that is such a uh, a loaded question because under normal circumstances i would say you haven't paid your rent you need to go now we have just six months into a pandemic. We have the highest unemployment rate that we've had in like probably since the thirties when the dirty thirties hit. People literally have no jobs and they're given this $2,000 a month. Now, when somebody is making $3,500 a month or more, and then they have to live off of 2000 and their rent is, 1800 um i think that we need to have a bit of compassion for that and um you know like um in bc what has happened is people have two years to pay back the rent that they owe so if you move out of your apartment building before that two years and you haven't paid they have the right to take you to court mm -hmm. right I agree with both that. So I agree that people should not be evicted, but they should have to pay the rent that they owe because at the end of the day, you pay what you, you know, you need to take accountability and you need to say, you know what, I'm back to work. I'm going to pay an extra $200 a month until I'm paid off. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, perfect. Because you know what? Every building owner was given a bailout from this government for them to cover their losses. Right? So the government has already helped them. They're not out any money, right? Um, they may have not been given the full 100%, but, you know, um, so single family units were, in Vancouver were given $300 a month 
uh, rent, rent relief from the government. So um, I have a friend who lives in my building. He pays 1500 a month for his apartment. When he was on CERB and he was getting the supplement, he had to pay $1,200 a month but that only left him with $800 a month, right? So thankfully mm -hmm. his car co company took care of his payments while this was going on, whatever. But there's so much more. People aren't just paying their rent. They're paying their, you know, like I pay my rent, I pay my car, I pay my insurance, I pay my student loan payment. I've got okay. lots of shit to pay. Okay, so what, yeah. what should happen to the people that don't pay anything so are they, are they not paying because they're choosing not to or because they can't? The, re the reason I say that is because there's going to be a lot of people out there that thinks the government money is just free money. Right. They know they're getting the money, but the majority of the people will think that the money is free money and that they don't need to pay their loan right away because at the beginning of the pandemic, the government did say, well, we're gonna stop evictions. We're gonna you know, put it on hold. We're asking the landlords to have some compassion. And of course they gave them a little bit of time in between, but yet within the two months or the three months that they were giving you time, there's six grand that they gave to a potential tenant. And I understand that they need to eat and understand that you need to pay the hydro. But these were things, I'm just saying, the reason I'm saying this is because from my experience, they didn't give me a dime, but um, they gave me my tax money, my trillium and my, um, what you call it, GST. That's it. Right. But for people who got the 2000, let's just say this is going into the fourth month now. You have eight grand. There should be no way you should be $8,000 in debt of your rent. Even if you gave the landlord half of the 2,000, right. you should only be a month or a month and a half behind in your rent. Now, if you were behind before this pandemic, then- Well, then that's on you. Okay. Now, yeah, I don't want to get into the whole political thing about how people should run their lives with it, but I just wanted right. to talk about the eviction thing because I think that it's important that we bring that up during the pandemic. And eviction cause, you know, here's the thing though, is eviction causes way more issues than just throwing that person out of the apartment. You know, now we've got a person on the street and now they're going to be accessing our government services, right? So... It, it's this snowball effect. And, you know, so if we evict everybody in Toronto, mm -hmm. good luck. <laughs> it wasn't, it, I wasn't, I was trying to, trying to narrow it yeah. down about the. So about here's the, the thing. The if you, the wagon thing. Right. So if you have, so here's the thing in BC, if you were doing anything that a landlord view, viewed as unethical while you're not paying your rent, you were allowed to evict them. An agreement that I would make with a tenant is I would say, you know what, you're doing everything possible to like help yourself. So like, I'm going to just leave you alone. But if you showed up to my door after a three day meth bender to talk about how you can pay your rent because you had no job, I probably wouldn't have any sympathy. Mm hmm now, because now, now I mean, I, I just, I just want to cut and dry. So let's leave it there, okay? Yeah. Um, I want to talk about the next thing. Is as you know, a lot of the LGBT two spirit pronoun community are, is out of work, or they get government assistance. And you know, we live in the most fall off the wagon community anywhere on the planet the LGBTQ community. Yeah. I call I call the I call the 12 step meeting from the gay community the comeback the comeback time. You know, every Saturday night you see it and it's the same 12 people coming back from their Friday night debauchery. And what it is, it's a it is when people relapse, especially after a long time of sobriety, you know, these people who are like five, six, seven years clean and they think it's gonna be different. 
it's because they forgot their step one. And that is where they admit that they have an addiction and that they're powerless over it. Mm-hmm. And that's usually where they'll learn, where you'll learn that person's story. And so what I say is people forgot their step one, right? Mm-hmm. Which is to show up and admit and be accountable on a daily basis. So unfortunately, this community and like the apps are the biggest setup for a person struggling in recovery. Those apps are like, it's like, you know, it's like meth head central on Grindr and Scruff. It just is. And it's even worse on BBRT. And, and so like for me, um, I keep my dating app used to a minimum and I'm never on them after 10 o'clock at night because I know that 95% of the people out there are strung out and methed out and it's only gotten worse since this pandemic has started. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's an unsafe um, situation because at least when you're, when you're at a bathhouse, there's staff, it's monitored, there's other people there. So you really can't be um, victimized there. You know, like when we were talking about the story about Ryan Boa, you know, that happened in his private home. He brought somebody home to drink and all of a sudden he was not into what was going on and the guy beat him and raped him. And those things don't happen in bathhouses. And people say it's disgusting that we have drug use in the bathhouses. Um, you're, you know what? It's bathhouses are not churches. Mm-hmm. and you know we're not there to go for dinner we're not there to hang out we're not there to make a friend we're there to get laid mm-hmm. and i'm not i'm not advocating people to go to the bathhouse but at least it's a safe environment at least if somebody overdoses there's probably narcan at the front desk you can save that person's life um and if you're in a private residence with a stranger your story can be like ryan Boas. Mm -hmm. Right. So bathhouses, you know, have only infused the dysfunction on the apps. Right. And even Mm -hmm. though everyone's like, oh, we're going to do our part. um, You know, we're reminding everybody to social distance, you know, not to hook up. We're taking we're we're taking the quick connect, quick connect and party listing ability ads, uh, you know, sections off of our apps while this is going on. Well, no, close the fucking app. Mm -hmm. right we're you know we're not looking for for covid stats on fucking Mm grinder and the only reason they left it open is because people have paid subscriptions so Mm -hmm. they don't want to lose that money and so it's it's gross Mm -hmm. well you know (laughs) Um, uh, let me just let me cut you out for a minute there i want to i want to get on to something else that will tie into that now you know a lot of the performers haven't really woken up to the reality that this actually might be the end of their career. This pandemic might be the real end to a lot of their careers and their legacies in the community, which is soon to disappear. Whether through the fact of we're going to all in the next year or two or three years try to get back on track, get back to our lives, rebuild our credit, rebuild our homes, rebuild some sort of normalcy we're used to. But for performers who are already marginalized and mentally ill and suffering from addictions, they have not come to the realization that being inside your house as an entertainer must be terrifying. I am lucky because I know how to talk. So they pay me to talk. So this is a good, the pandemic is working for me in a sense. But (laughs) (laughs) I feel really, even though a lot of them I I don't like, and I don't like the way they've done things and have done things and done things to me and many others, I really feel that the pandemic for the performers in our community will have a real devastating impact if it's not already having an impact because we know queens have the biggest prides in the world 
and we know how the majority of them live because you know we've been to a lot of their homes even before well, you, the pandemic. You, you know what there's this there's this meme going around saying that um it's a deborah cox meme and and you know prides have been canceled mm -hmm. worldwide and they said that deborah cox is gonna have her is gonna you know essentially uh Essentially, it's, um, it's you know, um, <laughs> people are, are making jokes, and it's true. Deborah Cox really probably cashes in on the Pride season. Um, mm -hmm. Legendary performer, Toronto-based, uh, you know, legend. Um, but is she going to be legendary after this, right, is, mm -hmm. is what the question is. And, and here's the thing, is... There was not a lot of opportunity to make money as a drag queen prior to 2009. Well, no, I'm going to say after season four of Drag Race, you know, when people saw it was a $100,000 prize, every bitch in town all of a sudden wanted to put on a face, you know? Mm -hmm. And here's the thing. You can be taught how to dress. You can be taught how to do makeup and you can be taught how to do a wig but you cannot teach talent. There you go. That's true. And I say that because as a competitive figure skater, I know these things. Mm -hmm. And I know that if I really wanted to focus on doing drag and, you know, um, and I auditioned for Drag Race Canada, because I know how to talk and because I know how to act, I would probably pass that audition, right? Mm -hmm. But then we'd get to that sewing challenge and fuck bitch, I would be dead. I'd be the first one up lip syncing. And knowing <laughs> my luck, I would be put up, by, put up next to somebody like a Shea Coulee and I'd get, you know, it would just be the way it happened, right? Mm -hmm. And I mean, if you went home to somebody like Shea Coulee, I mean, that's not such a bad end to your story. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I feel sorry for the contestants from season 12 of this year and from All Stars 5 and, of course, from Canada's Drag Race because, you know, all these girls had things lined up, right? Mm -hmm. Once their casts were announced, they were, you know, all these cast announcements were done before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And so they had fucking schedules full, you know? And, you know, yeah, the season 12 winner got her $100,000, right? But usually mm -hmm. you're going to make another $200,000 by the time you've done all your shit after your first year. And you mm -hmm. better have banked that money because then there's another bitch coming up, up the pipe mm -hmm. with another crown. And you know what? She's going to be thinner and she's going to have more fucking filler in her lips. And she's going to have that one extra dance move that you don't have. And all of a sudden she's headlining the tour while you're in second. Mm -hmm. Now, if you look at statistics in Hollywood and show business, less than 1% make it. And I'm not saying... I'm not saying the person who has a regular spot or a regular sentence on Sense8 on Netflix. I'm mm -hmm. talking about the bitch who's booking a $30 million movie. Mm -hmm. And the same can be said for drag. Now, you were very fortunate because you got an opportunity that a lot of bitches didn't. Mm -hmm. And when you got onto Lacage, you know, mm -hmm. that was a fucking select group of girls and you couldn't just be a one trick pony you had to have a plethora of skills to show and mm -hmm. you do and it's not just that you looked like Janet Jackson or that you had nice clothes it's because you could get on stage and you could stop audiences and you fucking kicked and bucked and did splits and backflops and flip flops and all of that shit and you can still do it at 60 but the bitch who fills in on a Sunday night at Woody's uh, between the head performers, mm -hmm. they're all of a sudden going to be canceled out because there's not going to be that budget. Mm -hmm. And I'm hoping that they will have realized that they weren't going to be the next Brooklyn Heights. And I'm not trying to insult them, mm -hmm. but you better have something down the pipe for plan B. Because if you don't have plan B, plan C is going to be the streets. Mm -hmm. So that is my lesson to these girls is that 
I had lots of money when I quit skating and now I don't have lots of money. Mm -hmm. And so take it from an old seasoned bitch like me (laughs) that you better just get a fucking job. And Mm -hmm. in three years, if drag starts to pick up again, pull those fucking Le Chateau dresses that you happen to buy and pull out your makeup and maybe book a few gigs here and there, but less than 1% of you are going to have a career. And that's just the real T. And you it's know, not... Well, you know, you, you, you're so right. You're so right. I see that even... Um, I will be very surprised if even RuPaul's Drag Race can hold on for three well, years while everybody struggles through trying. It doesn't matter which city you in. Well, it's not, it's not RuPaul's Drag Race that has to worry. It's owned by VH1, and they are a billion-dollar company, so the, mm-hmm. the production for them uh, is very little. They're, you know, like, they're already, it's already, it's common knowledge, Season 13 is being filmed right now. The girls were sequestered and isolated for 14 mm-hmm. days before they were allowed to go on set. And so we're all, you know, th- th- I feel sorry for VH1 because they literally had to rent six hotels to sequester all of their staff mm-hmm. because you cannot work on set until you've isolated for 14 days. Mm-hmm. And even then it's there and back and there and back and nobody goes home now. Mm-hmm. Well, for so, me, I wasn't, I wasn't so much, I wasn't trying to pick the show out in general. Yeah, I was yeah. trying to make it clear that most businesses will be struggling to get Absolutely. back on, Absolutely. on track. Now, these performers, whether you're RuPaul's 13, 14, or 15, we know nobody in Canada, and, and mainly we know we've been around this city this country forever. We know nobody's going to pay you $3,000 to see you. Mainly when we have to socialize, when we have to socialize at a distance, we can have very few customers in the bar. We can have very few people. No meet and greets. There you go. And this is a, a, a no time limit thing. So there's no time limit on when all of this will change. Of course, it's going to change slowly. But what happens with the communication between you, the community, RuPaul's Drag Race, or whatever bar or shows or pageantry system are trying to put these communities back together that were connected so well? Here's, here's, you know, they've canceled Continental this year. They've canceled Miss, US, Miss Gay US Have. They've canceled EOI. You know, mm-hmm. some of those girls had already spent thousands of dollars on their packages. They spent sometimes two years getting ready for that event. Mm-hmm. So, you know, thankfully, I'm sure J- the owner of Continental, Jim Flint, has a few dollars on the side mm-hmm. that he can take the loss this year. Mm-hmm. but he's a smart fucking bi- that bitch is smart that guy is i don't care how old he is that mm-hmm. guy knows how to run a business well he's old school old school yeah old school honey <laughs> that guy you know what i swear to god it's the botox in his forehead that keeps him alive but um <laughs> sorry jim you know i'm just kidding um but does he want to go do i want to put this money up next year because is that bitch going to make me money because she can't go anywhere Mm -hmm. right and i guess i shouldn't say you know that bitch but like usually well well, we know that uh, just in the business sense jim flint is smart and not just jim flint many business people are smart and of course they're going to have in the back of the frame of their mind is that we used to pay this person this we used to pay this person this. And we knew the basic overall budget. Right. But now, of course, when these other reality shows start pushing for, mm-hmm. let's just say Pose, they start pushing the, 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 the trans women to do talks, to do meet and greets, like you said. And this is not, these kind of things are going to come up. And then, of course, there's going to be RuPaul trying to push her winner or the contestants from RuPaul's Drag Race. And then you're going to have um, 
other groups like the 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 balls seem to be making a comeback yeah. now the legendary balls they've stepped those up a bit they're going to be pushing and when you think about it they glamorize a lot of these things into like making them look like it's show business stuff that would be very appealing to us if we weren't in this pandemic right but you know chad I, I have to say this I, I i think that the girls hustling online yeah is, is, is good and bad so i'm going to tell you the good so the good is when you see somebody like Atasha Long, who is a legend mm -hmm. and one of the finest, like Dion Warwick, does Dion Warwick, Whitney Houston, she can pull any of those divas from the African community out and she fucking does it like you wouldn't mm -hmm. believe. And um, I know you do Dion Warwick too. I was just giving an example, but I understand. Yeah, I don't hate but when you see her, when you see her on on Zoom and she's working, she has decorated for for the gods, mm -hmm. and she is professional. You do not see the cocktail glass on the side when she's talking to her guests. You see, she's got a fucking bottled water. You know, mm -hmm. she's not one of those girls. Now, here's the problem that I have is is she was talking about how she struggled to make a couple hundred dollars on on Vimo and Cash App. But there was this queen, a, a, a nobody, who got so drunk that she passed out halfway through her number and woke up to $1,900 in tips. Mm -hmm. Now, this is something that was brought up in the first episode of Drag Race when they were all discussing, you know what, I got sober because I was a fucking mess. I didn't like how I was drunk. The person who went home first was this beautiful queen named Juicebox. She told her story and she said that people stopped coming to her shows once she got sober because people enjoyed to see what antics she would get up to when she was drunk because she was one of those reactive drunks. Now, I don't care what anybody says. You know, she went home first, but when she did her lip sync for her life, I was like, you know, I kind of like this bitch. She's got some, you know, she's got some talent. She's pretty. She's got, you know, she's got some personality on stage. Is she a legend? I don't know. Will she be? I don't know. But the point is, is if she's got some, some talent, not, mm -hmm. I'm not going to say she's the next star of Canada, but the fact that people stopped going to her shows because she no longer was a, a, a staggering drunk on stage is kind of, it's actually, it, it, it just irritates the shit out of me because mm -hmm. as, as a community, we should not be encouraging our community members to act like hot messes. And so you tipped this queen $1,900 in tips because she's passed out on, on her Facebook Messenger app live or whatever, and you think it's funny. Well, how the fuck do you know she hadn't popped pills and didn't overdose, and she wasn't sitting there dead? Mm hmm And no, so... No. Okay, go ahead. So I, I just, these girls that are... I, let me just, let me, I want to go back to, just, just so I, I don't want to interrupt you too much. I just, right. I want to talk about Tasha Long and the connection between her and Anaya, who is, they call the sleeping queen. Now, I understood, <laughs> I, to be queen. honest, I understood how she made the money. And it was, a, it was no fault of her own. It was the fact that she was trying to do something, I think, that was trying to benefit her friend. And it ended up benefiting her. Right. Because she couldn't just hold on. No. She did all she could to do what she could to support her friend. But in the meantime, she was so tired or whatever the situation was or so drunk, she just passed out. But, but the intentions were made at the beginning of watching Anaya, she was there to support her friend. Right, right. But now, it's... with Tasha Long, to me, I understand what she's saying. But people like Tasha Long should be should have a family because she's put put herself in so many of those pageant families she should be working in a family to me into 
the Continental Queen should have a telephone, all of them performing like they were doing with local merch. And I'm right. sure they were making some money. They probably and, didn't make enough money because the egos got involved. So well, there's a few of those. There's a few of those continental girls that kind of think the world is about them, and you know, and we are the you. Now, the the thing with Tasha Long for me is sometimes you can't do things alone, and right. think the world is going to say you're Tasha Long or you're Janet Jackson, or you're Tina Turner, and we feel sorry for you, here's a million dollars. Doesn't happen like that. What happens is that people <laughs> have an attention span of a net. And what I'll is, be honest. What is uh, it that you're doing, one minute, what is it that you're doing, Tasha Long, that the other 20 pageant queens from Continental aren't doing and looking just like you or better than you. And they're on at the same time as you. So who should we choose to watch? It's like watching TV. Here's the thing. When I see those Facebook live posts, right? They're usually, it's usually American Queens. In Canada, we can't use Vimo or Cash App because to prevent organized crime transferring money, we can't mm -hmm. use cash share apps amongst North American countries. So like, we have e-transfer up here, but they don't have e-transfer down there. You can't e-transfer money to an American person. So I feel that guilty watching because I'm like, you know, like I should be throwing them a couple bucks, but I can't do that because it's, it's just not, it's not doable. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, but it's, here's the thing. A lot of those girls, and especially the, the drag race girls, should have money in their bank for that rainy day. There's a few of them that are doing nothing right now. And so you know that they were stacking their cash away and they're posting, you know, laying on their couch in their houses on Instagram, not caring about anything. Smart girls. Smart. You'll never have a problem in the future because you'll go out and work again. And if this ever happened again, you're going to be good. Mm -hmm. I, I feel bad for the girls who just came off their seasons because this was their year to make that money for that rainy day. Now, as for Tasha Long, Tasha Long is, is a legend, an iconic legend in the United States and only amongst a certain age of people who know her. Now, I happened to meet her in Orlando and we had a great chat. Um, whenever I go to Orlando and I go to Southern Nights, I always see her. Um, she always comes up and says, hi. You know, she's a very gracious person, but she is not, you know, Cash App and Venmo is such a millennial thing that like, do I see a bunch of 25 year olds that are going to sign into Facebook to watch Tasha Long do Dionne Warwick or some old school Whitney Houston? No. If you ask anybody under 25 who Dionne Warwick is, they're going to say, Oh, I've heard that name. Some black singer from the States, you know, you know, you know it's, I, I don't, let's not dig too deep into it. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> we understand that. There's very little money being made from the yeah. queen, no matter how hard they try to do their hustle. Um, I hope, I want to wrap this up. I hope that during this pandemic time that the queens will understand that they need a second career and they will understand that, like we've always known, show business is hard. And now with the pandemic, it's become harder. And how do you separate yourself from the others? How do you get someone's attention who's not really paying you any attention because record companies, TV shows, aren't really looking for anybody to do nothing? Not even Netflix, who's just open to our community. Right. These things down the road, 
they have so many shows already in the pipeline. You can imagine how many movies we would have already seen if the celebrities weren't on lockdown and they weren't, they couldn't do the sh movies that they're already contracted to do. Right. So in, in all fairness, I hope that during this pandemic, a lot of people don't fall off the wagon. They seek the help that they need. They absolutely to try to do what they do to keep a roof over their heads. And they continue to try to just create some content on whether it's online, offline, that will be valuable to them in the future. So they don't end up in this situation again, because I really do find coming up in the winter months is going to be the most challenging months for all of us. We right. haven't seen the drama yet. You know what? The gyms are open. I encourage every person to even just go and lift five pound weights. Do something with your day. Um, You're right. Do something. Do, do something. something. I can't remember who it is, but they says that today deserves a great you. So show up for yourself and, and, you know, and, and get support from those people who want to support you and, and you know, and support your local Queens. <laughs> but, um, you know, I want to say this here in closing, you know, I want the drag Queens out there, the performers, the dancers, and a lot of people who were thinking about opening the business, no matter what it was, but especially to our community, the LGBT two-spirit pronoun community. I want them to understand that this is an opportunity for them now. You drag queens out there, you've been watching each other do shows, you know who's doing what, you know who's determined, you know who's professional, you know how they look, you've been watching. Remember this, leases, buildings are for sale now, lots of leases are everywhere. All the rents are dropping down really low now. Lots of places for you to think about owning your own drag clubs, having your own drag business. Stephanie, of, you should open your own. <laughs> a lot, you know me, I've been, th I've been talking to my sister and she's been like, you too old, but uh, <laughs> Oh, she said, I'm too old to be trying to be worried with these children. And, um, and, <laughs> and, 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 and um, these girls need to think about that now. This is the perfect time for them to get together, even unionize themselves, understand that they can't be doing shows for drink tickets and doing shows for not what they're worth. They need to understand their worth. And they need to understand that there's an opportunity now for them to have their own clubs. Right. And on that note, I'm going to say, you know, I hope people don't fall off the wagon. Be strong. Get the help you need. If you need to reach out to somebody, reach out to Chadwick or send me a message and I'll send it to him. Um, hopefully people will get the help that they need and hopefully we will survive all of this madness with whatever addiction we are dealing with. That's stop being statistics. That is, that's stop being statistics. That's that great. Means, that's great. That's stop being statist statistics. Not the not the good ones that say you know you're part of th this statistic that has has changed your life. I'm talking about the other statistics that we look at because people don't ever look for the good statistics. They want to see the discrepancy in statistics. So I'm talking about the people that are dying, the people that are being raped and not reporting, the people that are being assaulted and not reporting. Let's stop being those statistics. Thank you, Chad. Um, You're welcome. Thanks. Thank it's welcome. great Thank to you. great to hang out with you again, Steph. You too. We will chat again soon. Absolutely. Now, um, ladies and gentlemen, I just want to say Thank you to Chadwick Conley for being very informative. We had a great long conversation here today about people falling off the wagon, about where we think drag will be in a few years and where we're gonna go, what people should do to try to reach out to get the help that they need. And hopefully we've had enough of a conversation and enlighten, to enlighten somebody to help people to understand that you are not alone. We are all going through this, but the challenging times are coming. 
and mainly in Toronto with the fact of the winter months are right out of the So take care of yourself, people, um, and do what you can. And over and out, Chadwick, hopefully somewhere along the line, there'll be a silver lining coming soon. But until then, Absolutely. my friends, good luck. And I will chat with you soon, Chadwick. Take care.